Okay, so your floor. Okay, let me share my screen. Let me know if it's all good. Okay, so yeah, thanks for the introduction and thank you for having me here. Uh, I'm Juana, as, as mentioned, I'm doing my PhD within WISE in SRV, but I'm also working for Odin Vision, you might have heard about it. It's a, um, it's a spin out from UCL that works on using AI to improve endoscopy and particularly one of the products we have is for colorectal cancer detection. So it's quite linked to what I'm going to talk about today, which is how to use spatial temporal information to improve the detection of colorectal cancer. Um, so without any further ado, uh, colorectal cancer, our problem, it's one of the most common types of cancer. There are thousands of cases every year, and this is, in, this is expected to keep increasing all over the world. And also COVID didn't help. There are lots of delays everywhere. So it's a big problem right now. The good news is that a lot of the cases are preventable, and the best way to prevent it is to detect it early on. And a way to do this is to do it through colonoscopy. So during a colonoscopy, the bowel, I've got a, a bit of an image of a bowel on the right hand side, is inspected with a colonoscope. Um, basically, the camera is introduced to the rectum and then the, the bowel walls are inspected to try to see if there are any polyps in it. Polyps are small protrusions, like small bumps in the wall that um, are not harmful themselves, but can develop into cancer. So it's important to first detect all of the polyps inside the bowel, and second, um, be able to make a decision about what to do with it, uh, depending on the type of polyp. So as I said, not all polyps are going to develop into cancer. So we can make an informed decision about this and we can either leave it and not resect it, or uh, not send it to histopathology, so we save times and costs and less waiting time for the patient as well. There's a lot of literature around these two tasks and lots of computer aided detection systems have uh, arised, arise, yeah, they've come up in the years, but one of the main problems we've seen is that most of these systems are developed using very nice curated data sets that usually are very, good quality, there's static images taken from the videos during the procedures uh, that go into the reports. Um, there's no noise in them, they're, they're clean, and you can see all the features of the polyps properly. Um, but colonoscopies are very messy procedures, as you can expect. So they're full of, they're full of noise, um, they're full of, there's a lot of cleaning, so there's water, so blurry, there's a lot of stool going on, there are hidden, polyps, uh, there's a lot of occlusions and so also there are artifacts, the, the camera is moving, so there's a lot of motion artifacts as well. So we want all of these systems that have shown really good results to work on real case colonoscopies and to work on these low quality frames that are in colonoscopic videos. And the idea behind, it, behind this presentation is that we as humans can use temporary information, even if we have a if we have a low quality frame and we're trying to see if there's a polyp in it, we probably won't be very sure. But if we have several low quality frames consecutively, then we have we can make a much better decision by seeing the polyp from different sides, for example. So can we use temporary information to improve the detection and characterization of, poly of polyps with uh, deep learning? So I'm going to first talk about polyp segmentation. And once this is to find polyps within the bowel, and once you find a polyp, you focus a bit more on it, you get closer with the camera, and then you do polyp characterization, which I'm going to talk about later on. So uh, diving a bit more into the problem, um, if we have a CNN uh, to predict where there are polyps in the images, um, if we look at the false positives, and when we make a prediction and there's a polyp there, but actually there's none, and we look at how long these false positives, so for how many frames they stay in the screen, we can see that most of them are really short. So the false positive length, the number of frames, is, is very short. 70% of them are actually just one frame long. And if you look at this video on the bottom, you can see there are lots of flashes um, detected as polyps. Actually, they're not polyps, they're false positives, and they're just coming up, and they're really short, and they're really annoying. And the same thing happens with false negatives. So in this second video, you can see there's a polyp there and it's predicted most of the time, but then 
there are flashes where we just miss it and then it's detected somewhere else and that's wrong. And again, these false negatives are quite short. Most of them are less than five frames long. So that means that we probably can do something about it with temporal information with the surrounding frames to reduce these instability in the missed predictions. Um, now, to solve this problem, the first thing that comes to mind is to use a 3D network. Um, so instead of just using uh, 2D as the image resolution plus a third dimension as the time, consecutive frames, um, so, sorry, instead of just spatial, we add a third dimension, which is the consecutive frames, the time. The problem with 3D networks is that they're, they're quite heavy, prone to overfit, and therefore they need more data to, to train. But as I mentioned, most data sets are just static images, they're not video. So we just take one or two images per polygon, that's kind of what we've got. So not only we don't have more data to train 3D networks, we have less data because we don't have many video uh, videos from colonoscopies. Um, so what we came up with was developing this hybrid 2D, 3D architecture for polyp segmentation. This is the architecture of the model. So basically, uh, each input, which is the yellow circle uh, input frame, goes through a 2D backbone. It's, uh, it's in more detail here at the top right, uh, which is basically a resonant backbone. So it's a resonant without the fully connected layer at the end and we get a set of features for that frame. We do the same thing for a set of consecutive frames. In this case, five consecutive frames would be the depth of our network. And we get five sets of features. And then we concatenate these together and put them through the 3D segmentation head. This is the only part of the network that's actually 3D with 3D convolutional layers and pooling layers. Um, and so it takes all of these features from consecutive frames and outputs one a segmentation map for the middle input frame. Um, and basically you would use a sliding window. You can use different depths, different number of input frames. Um, the idea behind this is that uh, most of the network is actually 2D and you can actually pre-train the backbone. So the 2D encoder on data sets that have both videos and static frames. And you would just need to fine tune the 3D head that's quite small on videos only. Um, we tested this on our internal data, which is a video data set. It had 46 videos with 53 polyps, so not huge, but quite a lot of variation, and um, over half a million frames, basically, both positive with polyps and negative without polyps. And uh, we tested in terms of different metrics. Um, it's a bit overwhelming, but we have sensitivity, specificity, precision, F1 score, the usual metrics. Um, dice score to test the, the quality of the overlap. So we create a segmentation mask and we, we, we see how the overlap is with the ground truth mask. And then these two metrics on the right hand side evaluate the temporal aspect of the prediction. So delta autocorrelation is basically looking at how, how different our predictions are from one frame to the next. So basically, we want the predictions to be quite stable. So if we predict that there's a polyp here in one frame, on the next frame, the polyp will probably not be over here. So we want it to be quite close. Um, so we're computing how different the, the masks, the predicted masks are from one frame to the next one. And we're comparing that to how much the masks move for the ground truth, because obviously the polyps will move a bit because the camera moves. So we want the delta autocorrelation to be low. And then we have the temporal coherence which basically evaluates how much the prediction split. So if you get a lot of short false positives, you would be predicting there are polyps and then there are no polyps and then polyps again. So lots of flips means low temporal coherence and we want it high. It's not a good metric by itself because you could predict no polyps at all and you would get a perfect temporal coherence, but you need to mix it with the other metrics. And basically we evaluated a 2D baseline. So this FCN is a fully convolutional network. It's the equivalent of our hybrid network, but just 2D, it takes one image at a time. And this was pre-trained on ImageNet. And then we compared it to two ways of training our hybrid model. Pre-training the backbone on the weights from the baseline. So actually we can just reuse these weights and just train the, the segmentation head. And uh, pre-training the backbone from ImageNet to compare properly. And basically what we found is that using the hybrid model increases the the results across the board. So the standard metrics are better. Um, also, the, the quality of the segmentation is better. We increase the dice score quite a bit. 
and the predictions are more consistent. So lower delta autocorrelation and um, a higher temporal coherence. It didn't actually make, make a lot of difference to pre-train on, on the baseline and to pre-train on ImageNet, uh, but maybe this would make more of a difference if our video data set was smaller. So in this case, the FCN was trained with both static images and video uh, data, but the hybrid model was just trained on video because you cannot train on, on static images. Here are some examples. So in this case, there's a lot of water going on and you can see the predictions are quite stable. Um, this is with a hybrid architecture. Um, in the next video, I don't know if you remember, I showed this earlier, there were lots of false positives going everywhere. Now we still have some, but a lot less. And again, the, the predictions, even if they're incorrect, they're, they're longer, so they're, it's not that annoying. And in this case, you can see there's the water, there are occlusions, the, the half of the polyp will get out of the screen and it's still quite robust. So you can see that actually it makes everything a bit nicer and smoother. Uh, we also tested all of these on an external data set to make sure that the network generalizes better because it's one of the problems from 3D networks. We tested it on the uh, Sun data set. So here we have some input examples. The ground truth is in the middle and the predictions in the bottom row um, with the hybrid network, which is that frame and surrounding frames to make the prediction. Um, I didn't put the numbers in here, but overall what we found is that the results were comparable in this data set and, and on our data, which is, uh, it shows that it generalizes quite well. And also our results were quite comparable to the results from the original paper that was trained on similar data as well. So that's also good news for the generalizability. And again, the hybrid was better than our baseline. So just showing the same thing again. Um, the other analysis we did was try to see if, um, if what happens if we do use different uh, input lens for the hybrid architecture. So the, the architecture I showed was, uh, it was showing only five input frames, uh, but we can, we can actually use three input frames or however many we want. Um, so here we train different models trained with different depths or, or number of input frames. Uh, the first one is just trained with one frame. It's actually not the hybrid model, it's the baseline. And then we increase the number of frames and we're evaluating different metrics. I'm showing sensitivity, specificity, and F1 score. Uh, it's shown in this cumulative way um, just because the results don't vary as much. So it was quite hard to see. So even when they're stuck like this, you, you don't see a lot of variation. There's a difference when you go from one frame to three. Uh, where you can see that the metrics improve quite a bit. And that's nice. It just means that we get the benefits of the hybrid network, even if we're just using three frames instead of one. Um, and then we see a decrease in performance when we go from 25 frames to 41. Now, I think the idea behind this is that if you use very long input depths, you're using 41 frames as an input, um, it depends on the nature of your data really, but if your polyp is only in view for a few frames in your data set, um, then you're drowning the polyp data with non-polyp data around it because colonoscopies are mainly non-polyp data uh, videos. So basically you're, you're inputting a few frames with a polyp with a lot of frames without a polyp and you're decreasing the sensitivity of the model and that's what happens. Um, but apart from that, the results don't vary too much. So there's not a big advantage to use seven frames compared to three, uh, which is good news again. And then the other thing we measured was the, the delay of the network. We have the network reaction time in red, and that's how long it takes for the network to predict a polyp first appeared in the video. So let's say a video has a polyp that appears for the first time on the third frame, and the network only realizes there are polyp, there's a polyp there on the sixth frame. So the network reaction time would be three frames. And what we can see is that it increases the bigger the input size is. And that, that's because, again, you're drowning the polyp information with non-polyp data. So if you have a large uh, depth, let's say 13 frames, uh, and a polyp starts to appear, then you the first time the polyp goes into your network, you would have one polyp frame and 12 non-polyp frames. 
And basically the network is just learning that that's not a polyp. So you're, you're increasing your delay the bigger the network is. Um, and the second thing is the time to detection. So that's similar to the network reaction time. It's the same thing plus the delay uh, from waiting for all of your images to be ready. So if you're using five frames and you're predicting on the middle one, you need to wait for the next two frames to be available to then run them through the network. So actually your, your two frames, that's an extra delay the user has to wait for. And uh, if you use very big windows, then you have to wait more than a second, which is quite a lot. Imagine having a second delay in a vehicle it would be quite annoying. Mm, but yeah, again, the good news is that you don't need big windows and you get the benefits from it. Um, so yeah, overall, we, we developed this hybrid 3D, 2D architecture. It improved the stability of the results temporally while keeping a good spatial representation and also allowing for pre-training from static data sets. We tested it on internal data and on external data, it showed good generalization capabilities. And it also showed uh, increases in performance across different, different metrics. So standard metrics, the quality of the detections, and also the, standard, the temporal stability. Um, it would be good to test these on perspective data using it online, because I have a feeling that the delay will affect quite a lot the way the user uses the endoscope. So this could, would be quite an interesting study. Um, but yeah, once you, you've detected a polyp, you focus on it and you do polyp diagnosis. So the idea is to try to identify what type of polyp it is um, based on the visual information. Um, in this case, we classify polyps between adenoma and non-adenoma. Adenoma are the, the cancerous polyps and non-adenoma are less dangerous. And um, again, there's um, the problem is the, the problem we're tackling is the instability of the prediction. So uh, this comes from the fact that polyps can change in appearance quite a lot. So here we have two images from the same polyp at different times from the same video. And here on the bottom, there's a timeline of the predictions of the CNN trying to classify the polyp. So actually this polyp is an adenoma and we're predicting it correctly. So that's the green bit as an adenoma most of the time, but in some parts of the video, we're classifying it as non-adenoma. And then the gray is when the polyp is not in view, so you cannot really make a prediction. Um, now, the problem with this is that most of the polyp is correctly predicted on most of the frames. So you would, you would account for this polyp to be correctly predicted overall, but actually in a real setting, you, the clinician wouldn't be seeing a constant input of, of what type of polyp it is. They would probably press a button, ask for a classification, and then the network would, would give the, the classification. But if we just press the button on the wrong time, we'll get a wrong prediction, even though our network is actually quite good. So what we would like to do is increase the robustness on polyps that we do quite well on already. So we're not trying to fix polyps that we always get wrong because those are quite hard to classify. It, sometimes it's really hard to see the features properly. But on polyps where we're pretty good, we're going to try to make that very good. So we, we take that risk off the table. And again, to be able to do this on video, we don't have a lot of uh, video data available. So we cannot really use 3D networks mm, to train. So we implemented two different ways of introducing temporal information in the decisions uh, through two, two ways that don't need a lot of data. One of them is an LRCN architecture, a long-term uh, recurrent convolutional network um, that basically takes consecutive frames, let's say K frames, passes them through a backbone, a confnet, same as before, to get a set of features per image. And then those features go through an LSTM module that at the end uh, incorporates all of the temporal and spatial information to make a final decision to say that polyp is an adenoma or non-adenoma. The second way, we wanted to compare this to like the most simple way of incorporating temporal uh, information in our results, which is just averaging. So basically you would take each image, pass them through a network with the fully connected layer at the end and get a decision per frame and then average all of the predictions to get a final decision. We tested this on internal and external data. 
And we found the same thing, basically. So we're testing the ComfNet, which is the baseline, just the ResNet 50. Uh, the LRCN, where the backbone is also the same ComfNet. And ComfNet averaging, where we take the baseline and we literally average over 15 frames. So we're using 15 frames. And um, basically, all of, the, all of the metrics increase when we use the temporal networks. Um, if we look at the area under the curve, it uh, there's not a big difference between what method we use so lrcn behaves quite similarly to to just averaging and the same goes on the external data so they both improve there's not a huge different difference between both methods we we were quite surprised by this and we looked a bit deeper to see try to see what happened and basically you would expect the lrcn because it's a more complex model and it wasn't overfitting in this case um, you would expect it to work better than averaging, but maybe it just needs more variation, more information in the clips to actually work better. So we analyze the performance based on the information in the inputs. So here you can see a clip where the, the video is actually moving. So that's 15 frames. Um, and that's what we would input to the network. And here on the bottom, it's just a static image, but actually it's just, it's a video where the image is frozen. We didn't actually use these cases but sometimes the camera is not moving very much and you don't get much variation. So basically on all of our input clips, we computed the cross correlation. The higher it was, the more similar the frames were to each other within that clip. And basically the more similar, the less new information you would have. So the less information you have, the LRCN worked worse. There's this tendency to go down. Um, it's all a bit noisy. We didn't have that many polyps, but it tends to go down. And uh, except um, for ComNet averaging, that's not the case. So when we have less information in the inputs, it doesn't really make that much of a difference. Um, so actually there's this thing where LRCN could maybe benefit, a be, be more beneficial if there was more variation in, in the inputs. And then the final thing we did was try to mix both pipelines. So first doing polyp detection, uh, if there's a polyp in the frame, we detect it, we put a box around it, we crop around it, and then that's the input to the polyp diagnosis to say if it's an adenoma or a non-adenoma. And what we did was this experiment where we, for each image, we changed the position of the box um, randomly, and then we evaluated uh, the performance of the diagnosis with cropping around those different boxes. Um, so basically, you would get better diagnostic performance if you just have a good view of the polyp. If you're missing half of the polyp, what happens? Or if you have a lot of background. And what it tells us is that you, the diagnosis models in terms of different metrics, say you see accuracy, sensitivity, et cetera, um, it works better if the boxes are better quality. So if the intersection of a union between the generated box and the actual ground truth box is high. So if they overlap a lot. So when you have a perfect box, that's when it works the best. And the same, the three models behave in the same way, but actually we see some things happening here. The ComfNet works worse than the two temporal networks. Um, the th second thing that's interesting is that if we take, let's say a 40% intersection of a union between the box we're evaluating on and the actual position of the polyp, it's not very good. Here, 30% intersection over union is the pink box. So it's, it's not that great. 40%, it's, it's okay, but not amazing. But actually, the two temporal networks are already doing pretty well when the boxes are 40% overlap. So actually, we're making, by, by, by using surrounding frames as well, we're making the models more robust to, to a wrong positioning of the boxes, um, which is quite nice because this is how it's used in, in real life. So yeah, just to summarize, um, we tried two different spatial temporal methods to just see how it affected the, the consistency of the predictions. Uh, we validated on internal and external data, and we showed that both, both methods increase the performance um, and the consistency of the predictions. Um, if they were exactly the same, I would personally choose averaging because it's a lot simpler, and if it works fine, that's great. But it, we did see that LRCN could be improved with longer segments with more variation. So maybe there's something there that 
if we did a different protocol where we tell the clinicians to actually hover around the polyps from different angles for a little bit, then we get quite a lot of variation. And in that case, LRCN might be better than averaging, but we would need to collect the data in a different way to do that. But it's quite an interesting thing to look at. And uh, also we showed that uh, using temporal information made the methods more robust to the position of the boxes. Um, there are lots of things we could test for this, but I would say the main thing is see how it affects uh, when we're using it online. Uh, we could use different backbones as well. And as I said, uh, see if LRCN works better when there's variation in the inputs. And yeah, that's it. If you have any questions, please let me know. Okay, so in the interest of time, let's um, all of us thanks Juana for an amazing um, presentation. Thank you very much, Juana. If anyone has any further comments or questions, you can reach out um, to Juana and discuss. I'm sure lots of people here are working on similar temporal related um, learning approaches. Um, but to, to move on to our um, next speaker, I would like to introduce everybody to Rema Daher. Rema is a second year PhD student in VICE, and um, she's also working on endoscopic video analysis and specifically on the temporal learning approach to inpatient endoscoping specularities and its effect on image correspondence. Rema, the floor is yours. Hi, everyone. So let me share my screen. Can everyone see that? Yep. Okay, so uh, my name is Rima Daher, um, as uh, Evan was just saying, and I'm a PhD student uh, here in UCL and the Surgical Robot Vision Group. Um, and uh, today I'll be discussing my work, uh, the work that I've done and which is titled A Temporal, uh, a temporal Learning Approach to Impainting Endoscopic Specularities and its effect on image correspondence. So first of all, I'll start with an introduction of the topic. So videos and computer vision are utilized to guide minimally invasive surgery and provide information on tasks such as lesion detection, instrument uh, navigation, and anatomy 3D shape modeling. However, computer and human vision are hindered by blur bubbles and irregular light patterns such as uh, can be seen in the image on the right. Uh, the aim of my research is to handle such artifacts and improve surgical video quality. And the solution to this problem is reconstructing the lost texture that is hidden behind these artifacts. Um, so to reconstruct artifacts, I first looked into specular highlights. Particularly, specular highlights affect various surgeries, including oscilloscoplasty surgery, dermatological imaging, cervical cancer screening, laparoscopy, uh, cardiac imaging, and finally endos endoscopy. So endoscopy um, I'll, is the part I'll be focusing on in my research. Um, and the, uh, the problem with specular highlights is that uh, that differs from normal occluding objects is that they follow irregular motion and shape patterns. And they do that by changing position, disappearing and appearing according to multiple variables including tissue properties, light incidence, and camera position. So to handle such challenges, several solutions were proposed in the literature. One solution relied on removing specular highlight pixels or frames from consideration in computer vision tasks, such as feature matching. However, this solution still does not solve the loss of data problem. Another solution is imprinting these specular highlights. And painting was proposed through different methods. The first method uh, relies on optimization to find the optimal imprinting patch spatially or temporally. However, in this method, fields are assumed to be homogeneous and thus do not perform well with complex motion. This method is also considered computationally expensive. It is also limited to local structures and fails to capture the, the global uh, environment. It also it also has parameter, uh, parameter tuning, which includes a, a manual uh, part of things and makes things as automatic. The second method uh, is the diffusion-based method, which propagates smoothly the information in the image to the missing parts. So it does a sort of interpolation. 
uh, this method also falls for local minimum and relies on parameter tuning as well. So to solve these issues, learning-based approaches were proposed. These work better and gave good results. However, they did not make use of the temporal information in videos and thus only relied on spatial information. So to introduce a temporal component into in-painting specular highlights, a look into general temporal video and painting was made. Uh, temporal video and painting is used in various applications, such as retargeting videos, restoring saturated areas, and removing objects from videos. And the different architectures used for this purpose are uh, recurrent neural networks, uh, convolution neural networks, uh, GANs, and uh, like these are the main ones, and there are branches of them as well. Um, these architectures were able to introduce a temporal component, but it was limited to closed frames, meaning that distance frames were not taken into consideration. So as a solution to that, attention-based GANs were taken advantage of in a system called Spatial Temporal Transformer Network, STTN. At the point of my research, this was the state of the art. Other approaches did build on this one and go work further. However, I will not be focusing on them today since in my system, I rely on STTN. To use STTN for in-painting specular highlights instead of the original application of in-painting objects in natural scenes, different challenges appear, such as the discontinuous movements of specular highlights, the few distinctive features and textures in endoscopy, the absence of geometric structures, as well as the absence of the ground truth. So in my work, I aim at handling these challenges by adapting STTN in an unsupervised manner, where specular highlights are first detected and then painted. For training, a pseudo ground truth dataset is generated and transfer learning is used by initializing the model with another one, which was trained on endoscopic data with spatially consistent yet rapid mask, uh, random masks. I then go further and perform analysis on the effect of in-painting specular highlights and endoscopy on computer vision tasks. The available analysis uh, either focused on qualitative analysis or had limited tasks evaluated or had inaccurate ground truth that relied on warping. Warping is inaccurate since it treats specularities as static objects. And these analyses all rely on old in-painting approaches. So in my work, I perform both quantitative and qualitative analysis. I evaluate on disparity, optical flow, and feature matching. I use accurate pseudo ground truth, and I rely on a new in-painting approach. Moving on to the technical work, I will first show the STTN architecture that was adapted in my work. So STTN includes spatial temporal transformers with multiple layers and multiple heads. And these are sandwiched by a frame level encoder from the left side and the decoder from the right. Uh, the decoder and encoder are made up of two deconvolutional layers and used to encode features from frames and back again. So they're not shown in the figure here. Um, in the figure, we can only see the spatial temporal transformer which has multiple heads responsible for running the transformer across different scales to handle complex motions. Um, as for the multiple layers, they help in improving the attention output by taking advantage of updated region features. The transformer is made up of three steps, which are embedding, matching, and attending. So in the embedding stage, the features are outputted by the frame level encoder and mapped into query and key value pair embeddings. In the matching stage, which is carried out in every head, the attention weights are then produced by every found patch using a softmax function, alpha ij. In the attending uh, stage, we get the output from the query using the attention weights summed up into oi. The results from the various heads get concatenated and inputted into a residual block to maintain frame-wise context. So to, to adapt this architecture that I just explained uh, for the task of object removal in diverse scenes to specular removal in the endoscopic scenes, some modifications have to be made. First, their model is trained on painting diverse videos using random masks with frame ensured continuity. So they create random masks and they train on them uh, to have the ground truth. 
For our case, a pseudo ground truth was created for training by segmenting specularities from hyper Bayesian data set using the chromatic characteristics of the specular highlights. After segmentation, the outputted masks are processed by translating them and removing overlap with original specularity locations. So in a way, the new specularity locations now uh, uh, are in a, in a position that was not there before. So in these areas, we actually have the, um, the texture behind them. Um, so in a way that would make them cover up visible or unoccluded texture. And this way, a pseudo ground truth is created. And this pseudo ground truth was used for training. But first, the model was initialized by another one that was trained on temporally continuous random masks, as was done in STTN, but with endoscopic videos. The output seen on the far right is the impainted output when the input mask contains the original specularity locations. So this is the, um, the output with the, with the test images on the actual location of the specularities, not on the pseudo specularities. Several experiments were performed to assess our system. First, two models were analyzed. Model SC, which was trained from scratch using pseudo ground truth, and model TC, which is also trained on the pseudo ground truth, but it was initialized with another model trained on endoscopic videos and spatially consistent random masks, as was mentioned before. Uh, on the left, we have four consecutive frames that show a change in the shape uh, and size of specularity. If you look at the yellow circles, you can see how some texture is available in previous frames, and the model should be able to use it for impainting with detail. So looking closely at the results from the two models, the yellow circles show the captured details that we get with transfer learning, as opposed to training from scratch. This was also evaluated quantitatively using peak signal to noise ratio, PSNR, and mean square error MSE metrics. From these tests, model TC gave better results than model SC. The other learning-based approaches that solve this problem do not have a temporal component. And since their systems are not open source, I use an ablation study to show the importance of the temporal component in this application. So to do that, the model was tested on one frame at a time, which made it act as a model with no temporal component. Uh, this was called model TCNT, where NT stands for no temporal component. The model was also compared to a traditional method represented as model child. It was also compared to the original STTN model trained on their data set, which we will denote as model STTN. If we also focus on the yellow circles, we can see that our model, depicted as model TC, has the most detail and is the best in capturing the things. This was also quantitatively evaluated in the table shown where our model achieved the highest mean PSNR value and the lowest mean MSE values. The model was also tested on other data sets to ensure generalizability. So SurfCT and SCARED are different from the trained data set since they are collected from ex vivo porcine cadavers. As for the private data uh, from the endomapper team, it is as similar to the hyperglazier data, since it is also in vivo GI endoscopy. However, it was collected in a different hospital. The yellow circles show successful impaintings, and the red ones show failed ones. In surf CT, impainting was not very good since the data consisted of only keyframes, which makes the temporal component not work properly. However, it was still satisfactory and um, uh, and the red circles here show an issue with the detection method since it only detected part of the specularity. As for the scared data set, impainting worked well in some cases, as can be seen in details in yellow, and not so well in other cases, such as where the texture is very dark, as seen in, in the red circle. Uh, the private data uh, from the Endomapper team uh, gave great results, with some details being impainted perfectly, as seen in yellow, and others not as good as seen in red. When looking at the whole sequence um, and visually assessing, we see that in general, the model is generalizable. However, transfer learning is advised for more accurate results on ex vivo porcine data, such as the, the squared and surf CT. 
So I'm just gonna pause here a bit to, to see the videos. So moving on uh, to analyze the effect of painting specular highlights in endoscopy on other computer vision tasks, we first start by evaluating disparity. So for disparity, SurfCT dataset with ground truth was used. And even though the dataset only consists of keyframes, the output showed improvement in disparity with painting, as can be seen visually and quantitatively on the right. Um, so the positive values show improvement on the basis of BAD3, RMS, and EPE metrics. So moving on to feature matching, matches between features are shown in green and the removed low quality features are shown in blue. We can see that the original frame pair matches are much more uh, than those generated from the impainted frame pair. This indicates that without impainting specular highlights, much lower quantity, quality feature matches are generated. So to assess optical flow now, FlowNet2 was used for estimation. Visually, the results were significantly better with impainting uh, with smoother and more homogeneous optical flows, as can be seen on the bottom, uh, on the bottom row. Um, here we can see the whole sequence of uh, one of the videos that was tested on. And we see that the, the unpainted uh, images gave better optical flow. For the quantitative analysis of both feature matching and optical flow, uh, since there is no ground truth present, uh, pose estimation was performed using RANSAC, and the matches that were generated from feature matching and optical flow separate, um, uh, were used separately for the pose estimation. And this way, um we can we can identify how good scared and surf CT data sets uh, were uh, using pose estimation instead of um, instead of directly uh, evaluating uh, the data set on optical flow and feature matching. Um, so the scared data set was used here, not surf CT, sorry for the um, mishap here. but the scared data set was used since it has post ground truth. So to assess the results, the translation and rotation errors in degrees, as well as the number of inliers were used. For feature matching, the impainted results in blue gave more low value errors than higher value errors, which shows the improvement of feature matching with impainting. The number of inliers was also lower with impainting, which might mean that bad features are being filtered out more easily with impainting. But on the other hand, the optical flow results did not show any significant change. In fact, it was even degraded a bit with impainting. However, since the amount is very small, no par a polarized conclusion can be made. Since visually with hypergrazier, impainting improved optical flow estimation, I tried to analyze the reason why the quantitative results were inconclusive. The reasons might be because, first, the scale data set had lower quality impainting results than hypergrazier. Also, the estimated flow might not have improved a lot because the scared data set is collected in a controlled environment where the motions are steady, clear, and have less artifacts and have easier features to track than endoscopic data. Also, pose estimation is not expected to improve significantly with optical flow since pose estimation uses RANSAC, which removes outliers that can make it robust to some of the artifacts in surgical video streams. Also, optical flow provides dense matching with a surplus of information that could compensate for outliers. However, even though the results were inconclusive in pose estimation, the improved optical flow that was assessed visually is advantageous in other tasks such as 3D reconstruction. Um, and this is mainly it, and this is my, the results we got. And thank you so much for listening, and please let me know if you have any questions.